Good morning, good evening. We are the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the Lord Jesus Christ. So we'll pick up where we left off last week. We were looking at this handout entitled, The Essence of Man. We have a couple of new people here. Welcome. But I think you may not have a copy of this, and I need it. This is the last copy I have. So, do you want me to run some copies of this? Well, then I mean, I'd be with, yeah, maybe from somebody down there. It's if somebody loan Katie a copy, and we can run off maybe it's, for free. Mine is like written on a lot. That's good. Thank you, Katie. So, the first page is what we got through on this uh, five-page document, this five-page handout. It's entitled, Review by Way of Overview. Trying to summarize the points that we've been making over the last four or five weeks. Five, this is the fifth week. Uh, so that uh, we get a sense of what we're trying to talk about. We're trying to, um, we're trying to unpack the that, that statement uh, that we that we have from Saint Nikitas Stethotost, Stethotost, that uh, what does he say? The beginning of uh, the love for God. I'll find it real fast here if I can. The love for God begins with detachment from things human and visible. Purification of heart and intellect marks the intermediate stage. For through such purification, the eye of the intellect is spiritually unveiled, and we attain knowledge of the kingdom of heaven hidden within us. The final stage is consummated in an inexpressible longing for the supernatural gifts of God and in a natural desire for union with God and for finding one's abode in Him. We paired this text from St. Nikita's he's was in the, in the, uh, uh, the, the, the tenth, 11th century, disciple of St. Simeon, I have it up here. Um, yes, he was, uh, he, is, he was in the 11th century. He was a disciple of St. Simeon, the new theologian. We paired this text of St. Nikitas with John chapter 20, verses 1 through 8, in particular, of uh, Peter and John hearing from Mary Magdalene that his body was not to be found in the tomb. Uh, they rush to the tomb, and they enter into the tomb, and St. John, he says, he saw and he believed. We're seeing in these two texts a movement from, we could say, the visible to the invisible. We described it last week in our review by way of overview as a movement from this visible world which includes everything to the tomb. That we live on this side of the tomb. We live on this side of the grave. The um, invisible, however, is on the other side of the grave. And in order to get to the invisible, the realm of God, we must make our way through the tomb into the tomb of Christ, not just any tomb, but the tomb of Christ, and out into the beyond, out into God. And then he went, and, and then we pointed out that this movement, uh, that you know, everything is moving to the grave, willy-nilly. Everything is moving to the grave. Um, those who unite themselves to Christ find that this movement to the grave is an exodus and that our life becomes an exodus. I'm wondering, do you want to, should we turn that down so this, this heat doesn't come on again? Because I remember in the past that when this is on the camera, the, the heat comes on and just messes up the, turn it down by three or four degrees so it doesn't come on again. It's hard for the people on the YouTube and on the upload to hear when that fan is going. Um, 
that um, where were we? That the that this life of the, the, that united to Christ in our life, our, the movement of our life in this world becomes an exodus um, from the visible world to the invisible world by way of Christ's tomb, which corresponds to the Red Sea or the Jordan of Israel's exodus. So um, that was somewhat that was the nub of what we were talking about last week and what we've been talking about over the last few weeks. Uh, this evening I find myself, we're going to continue on page two of this handout and I find myself wanting to explain in greater, uh, ex uh, greater detail and also more uh, existentially, experientially, uh, how we experience uh, this, this movement from the visible to the invisible to the grave. So, um, picking up on page 2, line 56 of this handout. I'm sorry, those of you who don't have the text in front of you, so um, I will will read it. And um, if there's anything that you want to uh, talk about in more detail, please don't be afraid to raise your hand. And let's. These are basically uh, cryptic notes. You know, they're not in any way exhaustive. Um, so, starting up with, with line 56, that um, to this point, namely the point that what? That, okay, we, let's, so let's pick it up at fifth, line 50 so that we know what point we're referring to. The Orthodox Church is the body of Christ. And the body of Christ we were talking about last week um, is, is, is the movement of God into this world. And his movement, his, his movement into the kingdom of heaven. The, ch the Orthodox Church is the body of Christ. So to come into the Orthodox Church is to come into this interior exodus, this movement from the visible world to the invisible world, to the realm of God. This movement from um, uh, this movement into the tomb of the heart, where we are deep beyond all things, is to come into this interior exodus that is the heavenly pattern of Israel's exodus, which is the copy of the heavenly pattern. It is to come into the incarnate body of the only begotten God himself, which is the heavenly pattern of the movement of our life in this world. Revealing to us what this movement of our life in this world is straining for. The land of the living one. Or you know what, what if we were to uh, bring out the imagery of that. So, uh, this table over here, thanks. Um, what if we were to say that the movement of our life in this world is straining for? What, would, what if we were to say the body of Christ? Land would be the body. And the living one, of course, is Christ. So the crucified, buried, and risen body of Christ is what the world is straining for. Um, so I'd like you to catch the force of lines 50 through 55, especially those of you who did not have the benefit of being with us last week. We're saying that the movement of this world, in which everything is moving to the grave. This movement that all of us are in is a copy of the heavenly pattern. We went back to Exodus chapter 25, where Moses was shown the heavenly pattern on, on the mountain. And according to that heavenly pattern, he was to construct the temple, the tabernacle, and all of, its, all of its appointments, the tabernacle of Israel being centered on the worship of God among the sacrifices, the ablutions, the, the, you know, and all the washings and all of that. Um, all of that was a copy of the heavenly pattern. So that is, that in, in the, in the, uh, in the uh, literature, in the, in the, in the teaching of the Holy Fathers, that passage, Exodus chapter 25, verses 9 and 40, is quite large. It's, it's one of those seminal um, biblical texts 
um, so that we, be, we, we begin to see that, that, that everything in this world is a copy. It's not just happening happenstance. It's not just kind of thrown together chaotically or anarchically. Everything is moving according to a certain template, a certain pattern, which is the heavenly pattern. Um, so that's what this is. That, I want you, that, that's the, so just by you existing, just by us existing, you know, and we, we are in this, this copy. This world is a copy of the heavenly pattern. So the aim of the church is to align us with the heavenly pattern so that what we're in, that's this copy that we're living in and that we're moving in, um, is moving towards the heavenly pattern and not away from it. So to this point, namely that, that, the, that the whole world is unconsciously, you might say, uh, you know, in, 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 its, in, its, uh, in, in, the, in the fiber, the unconscious, even subconscious, whatever you want to call it, fiber, of its being is just instinctively, by nature, moving, straining for the eternal. To this point, let us note, picking up line 56, to this point, let us note first that we experience this movement of our life as erotic desire. All right? When we think, when we say movement, what do you think of? You think of a body moving from point A to point Z. You think of something spatial and physical. We want to begin thinking in spiritual terms. The movement we're talking about is this internal movement of the soul. And we experience this movement of the soul in our erotic desire. This is not necessarily a Christian revelation. Um, you find it, for example, in the Rig Veda, the Far East, the scriptures of the Hindus. I'm trying to remember what the passage is, and I can't. I want to say 60-something book, but I, I'm not even going to try. But that the primal seed of all, of all that is was, was Eros. And from Eros, everything springs forth. And then there is the, um, the statement attributed to one of the seven pre-Socratic sages, Pharaohitas of Saros. So we are in the what? I don't know. 600 years or so BC, uh, when Zeus uh, was about to create, he transformed himself into Eros so that he would bring together all the disparate parts into one unified whole. And then we find it in other places. You find it in the Chaldean oracle. I mean, it's just it's like it's a fundamental instinct of intuition. Of the, of, of the human soul. That what's, and uh, Tim Patitsas makes, makes this point in his book, The Ethics of Beauty, which was just recently published, that in the Orthodox Church, um, the root of all things is not truth, it's beauty. And the fun, so that the, 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 the root um, desire that moves us is this erotic desire for beauty. Not that beauty and beauty and truth are opposed, but if you conceive of the fundamental reality as truth, I mean, truth is the fundamental reality, but let's say that the fundamental reality that truth is, is the truth of beauty. This is what truth is, it's beauty. And we desire beauty, we long for beauty. So that if we see the fundamental reality to be truth, well then our perspective on life becomes rather abstract. Um, we become uh, ideologues, you know, Whereas, whereas if we understand that what we primarily long for is beauty, we love beauty, it just, it, it transfigures, it transforms. You know, the, the, the whole percept, perception, one's perception of life. Uh, Travis, you had a question. Well, one question I have when we're talking about this is, could you say that then part of the reason we have so many problems is that so many people are cut off from God's agape, that their eros goes wild and goes into all the wrong things. Yes, exactly. Yep. Yep. Colin? When you talk about beauty, do you mean to create to 
term, which I think Socrates equated also to the good in some texts, good, beauty. Yes, <laughs> yes, and everything else. Certainly Socrates is, is describing that. So we experience this movement of our life in this world as erotic desire. We experience our erotic desire, however, not only in the longing for physical union, centered on, here's something to think about, this longing for physical union is centered on the mystery of dying and coming to life, which so happens to be central to the mystery of God hidden from the ages, you know, death and life. So it's just something to think about. I don't want to go into it, it's something to think about. Our erotic desire, we experience it not only in the longing for physical union, but also in our thirst to know, to understand. And perhaps we should dare to say, in our desire for power. You know, think about it. Um, but is not this erotic desire and all that it carries satisfied only when we have become lovers who are beloved and beloveds who are loved then all of our longing for knowledge and for power is poured out into and for the sake of our beloved and knowledge becomes intimacy and power becomes a ceaseless self-emptying that's something you're going to have to think about that's perhaps a new concept for us to think about here, to introduce here. So we're not going to catch it right away, something to absorb and to think about. But second, here's your point, Travis. Let us note that our erotic desire has become perverted. It has turned away from the source of beauty and goodness. Here's your point for uh, Colin. And life that created heaven and earth and everything in it and finally created us in his own image and likeness. So think about that. Um, I mean, you know, we, we distinguish, I suppose, between tr truth and beauty somewhat uh, by way of contrivance. But um, if, you, if, our, if, our, if our understanding of reality is primarily that reality is beautiful, beautiful, that God is the source of all beauty and goodness. And you were created in his image. What does that say about you? You know? It means that you, in the very essence of your being, are beautiful. You are a copy of the heavenly pattern. You are beautiful, created as a copy of the heavenly beauty. So if that was if that was our, our um, self, our, our perception of reality, um, that I am, and, and beauty isn't, so you see, there's another side to this. Beauty then isn't as I define it. I'm not the one who made myself. And when I do make myself, I become ugly, actually. Here, I make this point on, the, on line 82 and 83. The image of creation as it was made by God is given in Genesis 1 and 2, where everything is good, beautiful. The word in, in Hebrew and in Greek means both beautiful and good, and, and teeming with life. This is the image of the creation that's made by God. The image of creation as it, was been, as it has been made by man is Golgotha. Um, so it's not I who define what beauty is. I don't define what my beauty is. It's God who defines my beauty, what, what, what beauty I am. And so it's only as I, as the copy, strive now to align myself with the heavenly pattern, then my, then, then my beauty, as I truly am, now it begins to come into, now it begins to be shaped. I begin to be shaped in, in the true beauty of God. And this is the truth of my being, if you will. Um, our erotic desire, however, has copulated with that fallen angel Lucifer in the hope of becoming as though we were God. So let's say, to simplify this down to its essentials, 
that our erotic desire has copulated with itself. The creature with a creature of which homosexuality is an image. Male and female uniting in marriage is in the image of Christ and his church. And so our erotic desire has turned away from the deep beyond all things, the deep that is the unfathomable and uncreated light of God, the deep that is it that is its the deep that is its that that is its original let's see what how does that read this the deep that is the unfathomable and uncreated light of God, the deep that is its original definition, there we go, the deep that is its original definition, whose horizon is far, far beyond itself. And our erotic desire, by way of its perversion, has, has turned it to itself as its own definition, its own horizon, creating the Euroboros, the serpent, swallowing its tail. Here, here, here comes into play the, uh, the, 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 the importance of, draw, of uh, our, our two terms that we're using, moving from the visible to the invisible, or moving from this, by visible world, understanding the whole of created reality, both material and immaterial, both visible and invisible, spiritual and bodily, the entire physical world. Um, when we turn our erotic desire to ourselves and to this world, you understand, we get stuck in the coils of the Ouroboros. And so we get trapped. We get trapped into our own, in our own, our, our own being. And the reason that feels so suffocating is because we didn't come into being from within ourselves. You know, we came into being from outside of ourselves. Our origin, this is our origin and our destiny is not in here. Our origin and our destiny are, be, are out there, beyond the grave, in the world of God. Um, We could go into Ephesians chapter 1 here, but I, I guess we'll, I'll, I'll resist the urge because we want to save that for when we can spend more time on that. L um, life or desire, picking up at line 75, life or desire has fallen wholly captive to the dust of death in the region and shadow of death that it cannot escape from. The Bible shows that the, Bible shows that the world was capitulated in man, man made of earth and spirit as heaven and earth made personal made into a temple of God, the male, the priest, and the female, perhaps we could say, the altar of that temple. And so when the priest and the altar became servants of the darkness of Lucifer, man became a temple of idols, not a temple of God. And the whole of creation fell into idolatry, which, as we read in the wisdom of Solomon, and in Colossians, and in Rome, is the beginning of death. The image of creation as it was made by God is given in, okay, I already said that, is given in Genesis 1 and 2. The image of the creation as it has been made by man is Golgotha. All right, now there's a lot to say on that. I mean, as I said, those are just cryptic notes. And there's a lot to say. So to help us figure out and to follow what I want to say on those points, Katie and Pam, could you help me? And these out. I need to save one for myself. I don't know if we have enough for every single person, so may, some may need to share. Why don't you have a question? Well, while you're speaking about this, I'm reminded of the prophecy that was given, I think, Isaiah, where he's watching a potter basically use clay, and how there was originally a beautiful base that he wanted to make out of two pieces of clay, one very soft, and he manages to mold into that. But one rebels, and then it becomes basically an ugly pit that eventually is thrown into hell. Would you say that's a parallel to what you're talking about? I think so. Yep. When we reject God, we reject beauty. We reject our purpose. Um, let's see. These are some, some comments, some thoughts that came to me as I'm reflecting more and more on, you know, I'm reflecting on line 65 through 84. So uh, let's go back to the line 65 on the first handout, the essence of man. And uh, let's pick, let, let's start off there. Second, let us note that our erotic desire has become perverted. And now we go to the, the uh, additional comments, the new, the handout that was just given to you. And we, and we continue. So, 
think about this. He experienced this perversion, perhaps, primarily as spiritual and emotional suffering. Because we can't have what we want. I'm referring to that passage in James. I didn't take the time to look it up. You, uh, you, you, what does it say? Um, you have, you don't have because you... You, you ask wrong. You ask wrongly, thank you. Yes. You don't have, to, you, you want what you don't have. And so that you have wars and, uh, and, and all these things because you know, you're, you're coveting these things and uh, you're asking wrongly. Thank you, Colin. Yes. Um, we, don't, we can't have what we want, which is to be as though we were God. Okay, that's an assertion. You think about it. That's taken from, taken from Genesis 3.23. Again, Adam and Eve were not expelled from the garden because they were not, because they transgressed. They were expelled from the garden because they would not repent. And they would not repent because they had become rather satisfied with themselves, wanting to hang on to the experience of themselves as though they were God. Uh, you're re we're reading in the Second Thessalonians, I think it is, for our epistle readings this week. And it talks about the uh, Antichrist when he comes, and he will be sitting on the on the, on his whatever his, his seat of power as God. Well, you, that that could be going back to Genesis 3:23, as though he was God. Isn't it more revealing himself to himself as God? That's well, the sense I picked up from that. Well, I'm sure that too, absolutely. But I also think that the Antichrist is the is the final the the, the 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 nth degree of the fall, where man has become as though he is God. I mean, you see it in Marxist uh, ideology, right? There is no higher power than the ideology of Marxism. Um, we are in, con in we are in constant hidden opposition to everyone around us who all are wanting to be as though they were God. All wanting to be worshipped, submitted to, to the point of consuming or devouring those who do not comply. I go back to my teen years, starting perhaps in the 8th, uh, ninth grade. I think it was the ninth grade actually. Um, I was blind to it at the time, of course. But I go back and I'm looking at my behavior and the things that I did to get attention, I can see very clearly that I was acting as though I was God. And, that was, and, and what I required of you was that you worship me as God. So that's something to think about. In what ways do I go about acting as though I'm God? And to what degree might you say that that is the source of all my problems, all my issues? Um, to the point that if you don't treat me as though I'm God, or the way that I want you to treat me as though I'm God, I get mad at you. I become, and I, and I engage in all kinds of different uh, games, you know, passive aggressiveness, uh, um, a justification, um, projections, um, you know, all kinds of things, in order to cast you in the light of, of the enemy because you won't worship me as God. But even the consuming is experienced as bitter frustration. Because if I actually succeed in overpowering you and making you treat me as though I'm a God, which is not going to be from your heart, but it's just going to be because of your own psychological disorders, that you treat me as though I'm God, I think what we discover is that uh, even then I'm still frustrated because I don't achieve what I wanted. What is, because you're, I mean, how, I don't know, you're, you're not a, you're just a thing now, you're not a person anymore, you're just a thing that I've devoured and chewed up, and now you're treating me as though I go, but what, what does that mean? Who are you? You're me. And so I'm still, I'm still not getting all the, all the adoration that I want. So what is generated out of our fall into self-deification are all those psychodramas, disorders and maladies that psychology likes to study. But even psychology is perverted when it is governed by a perverted mind that seeks to subject human behavior to the standards of the darkened mind's own presumptuous darkness. 
For what purpose? Alright, again, these are things that you're going to have to think about. <laughs> you're, I'm presenting these things to you for the first time. Perhaps I've never thought about these things. So, um, you're perhaps not in a position to, to comment. It's just something to think about. So, on lines, so I want to bring in St. Maximus the Confessor. Uh, as, as illustration of what we're saying here in line 65:34 of the of the uh, original of the handout on the essence of man, this is from his, his fifth century of various texts. He says this: God is said to be the originator and the begetter of love and the erotic force, for he externalized them from within himself. That is, he brought them forth into the world of created things. This is why Scripture says that God is love and elsewhere that he is sweetness and desire, which signifies the erratic force. For what is worthy of love and truly desirable is God himself, because loving desire is poured out from him. He himself, as its begetter, is said to be in movement, or because he is what is truly longed for, loved, desired, and chosen, he stirs into motion the things that turn towards him, and which possess the power of desiring each in the degree appropriate to it. The erratic impulsion of the good that pre-exists in the good is simple and self-moving. It proceeds from the good and returns again to the good, since it is without end or beginning. This is why we always desire the divine and union with the divine, for loving union with God surpasses and excels all other unions. Let's bring this out with a few questions. Where is this erotic force that is within us? Where is it originating? The soul. Come on up, Travis. We do we that. It's originating from God. Where does it end? Is it divine or is it created? Is it uncreated or created? Uncreated. uncreated. Is it therefore temporal or eternal? Eternal. It's never going to end. And this is the force that's moving through you. I mean, you have your own erotic force, to be sure. You're made, but, but your erotic force is the copy of this heavenly pattern that is the erotic force. And our arrows be said to come out of our soul, but the original arrows comes out of God, or am I misunderstanding your arrows? Let's, let's, should we go over that again? I, I don't know. It's a good question. We've, we've explained, we've given the answer some time ago. But it's, it's good enough that it deserves re repetition. We'll use this. Eros comes from two words. Et is from ek, from. And ros, I'm pretty sure, is from a verb that means to flow. And so eros means a flowing forth from. A flowing from. So now, if the origin of Eros is the self, in fact, I, I think we can say that my erotic desire is me in movement, then in my erotic desire, you can see how I am coming out of myself. What am I looking for? Why am I coming out of myself? Seeking the divine. Yes, ultimately I'm seeking the divine. I'm seeking, I'm see, I, like to, I like to put it in more simple terms that we can all understand. I'm seeking someone to love. I'm seeking someone who will love me. But I ask you to see in this movement of Eros, how Eros, by its very nature, is self-emptying. It's giving of itself. Can you see in this erratic movement, me coming out of myself, looking for a love? Can you see dying? Can you see dying? No greater love than this for one to lay down his life for his friends. That's Eros, is it not? Well, I have an English translation, so I'm going to have some. Probably. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, I, I think so. 
So, you know, what we experience is dying. This too we, we talked about. Uh, I think, Barb, you were here. I think a few of the others were here sometime last year. Um, what we experience is dying. I wonder if that is our eros perverted. Because when we come out of ourselves now, as a result of the fall, in which we want to see ourselves as God and we want others to see ourselves as God, where does this movement go as a result of the fall? You see, it goes right back into itself. Or it goes into the world, it goes into the creation. It's, it, you know, let's say, let's say that I'm here or whatever, and it goes out of me and I just go around, around, around. It never gets out. Here we go around in circles. The circle of life, yeah. which is the circle of death, actually. Um, so that our own dying is also the, our experience of our erotic desire. And because our erotic desire is frustrated, it can't get out where it wants to get, which is the divine. Well, you know, all kinds of emotional, spiritual suffering. All kinds, all kinds. Part of this too is if you love something that you know you, that you know sometime, someday is going to die and it's not going to be, you can't have forever. And that's and that's that part creates, of that frustration. That, that creates frustration, a yeah. suffering, a sense of maybe hopelessness or meaninglessness. Yeah. Despair, depression. Despair, depression. Um, Travis? I'm sorry, this has broken one of my mental models, so I was wondering if you'd help me read this Okay. So, when I think of my heroes, I think of neediness. It, neediness? It, neediness, wanting, something, yes, okay. craving. And it, it's not an outflowing of me, it's a desire to pull oh. something in. And I, oh. and I arrows to God's agape. So I'm not under, that, that's the. That's the flow that I understand Eros and got me. So what's a better word for what I'm thinking? What am I missing? A better word than Eros? It is that different? Yes. What's that? <laughs> what? It is, yes. However, Maybe so. However. Just a minute, uh, uh, um, Jason. Maybe that's, a, maybe, maybe that's an example of how my Eros has become covetousness or idolatry. I mean, that's what St. Paul says. Um, um, that he, 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 he equates covetousness with idolatry. I want it. Well, why do I want it? What am I seeking for when I want it? You know, what am I looking for? Why do I want it? What am I looking for? Honestly, what am I looking for? Looking for God in all the wrong places. Exactly. And am I not looking for something that's eternal? Something that will satisfy my, my deepest longing? But nothing ever does. Except God. Except God. So, so is, what is the word for that needy, grabby, longing desire for God? Is well, maybe error? we could say, you help me. Maybe loving, uh, maybe seeking, um, desiring. Um, it is still Eros, but yes. it is an Eros that is trying to get out. Of well, I think what Travis is expressing is how our culture has so perverted even the notion of Eros. That when we think of eros, we think of covetousness, or we think of we think of perversity, and that for us is erotic desire. And so then to learn that erotic desire actually originates in God. Yeah, you know, like Travis says, it breaks the model. Whoa. Um, but again, it's something to think about. I think it should break the model. Because our model is so focused on the abstract, you know, truth, ideas. Um, so that you become, you can become religious. And you believe you're religious because you believe all the right things. But there's this ache in the soul that's not being touched. Because you're taught that all things, everything down here is what? Evil? Perverted? Well, yes it is, but there's something even deeper. And it's the perversion that needs to be broken. So that this longing for the eternal can be freed. 
you know, so that the erotic desire can be made well and move in the way it wants to move, which is out of itself. Why do you always fall in love with guys? Why do you fall in love with a girl? Girls, why do you fall in love with a guy? You know, what are you looking for? You're Get looking for, I'm sorry, what? Get out of yourself. There you go. Yes. To get out of yourself. It's like you want to get out of yourself. Uh, you want to deny. And honestly, when you fall in love with somebody, how is it hard to deny yourself? Is it hard to lose your life for that sake of the beloved? Not at first. <laughs> <laughs> the voice of broken dreams. <laughs> there is the voice speaking of the, to the fact that this is the fallen world. We can't, you know, I think it speaks to the fact that we simply, that in fact we cannot love. And yet, look at Hollywood. They're, 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 they're breaking up, they shack up and then they break up. How many times in their life? No matter how many times they break up, they still look for someone else to shack up with. And the tabloids keep telling us about it. And the tabloids, and we love to read it. I suggest that this speaks to the fact that there is something, there is something in this erotic longing of ours that is divine. And that's what we never get tired of it. We might get jaded. But that's generally after we've been burned so many times that now, you know, our soul now is just beaten down. And I mean, now, I mean, now we're near despair. I mean, this, this, is, this is the time when we're, when we're starting to die in real terms. You know. But, um, so, you, the, the point is that this, and, and I think you could do a study and show that even when you get to that point, the erotic desire has not died at all. It's just taken a different form. And, how, and it can't die. This erotic movement in us is from God. It is the very, uh, you could say, this is the essence of man. Our longing for God. Our longing to come out of ourselves and to love as we have been loved. But to get to my point, Kate, okay, before you interrupted us, <laughs> I would offer that you that when you're in love with somebody, before the dream has been broken, when you're in love with somebody, dying to yourself and denying yourself is, the, is what you want to do. You cannot not do it. Amen. So when the Lord says, uh, whoever would be my disciple, let him deny, my, deny himself, take up his cross, take, deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Let him lose his life for my sake and the gospel. What is he saying? But whoever would be my disciple must love me as I have loved you. Because how did I get here in the first place that I'm talking to you in the flesh? I emptied myself in my erratic desire for you. And I clothed myself in this stinking garment of death and corruption that you clothed in. So that I could become one with you. So you want to love me? Well, you've got to be like me. You have to be, you know, you have to become the copy of the heavenly pattern. Here I am, the heavenly pattern. I have emptied myself and given myself for you. Come to me, all you who are, how does it go? All you who are, are heavy burdened, labor and are heavy burdened, come to me and I will give you rest. You know? Um, so, this is the movement in which creation is created. It comes into being from out of this erotic love of God, God coming out of Himself and pouring himself out into the creation. Um, we see this creation in movement in Genesis 1 and 2. And you see this movement of creation. Where does the movement go? This is an interesting thing to, to think about as you reflect on Genesis 1 and 2. Um, you can, I'll just, uh, let me outline the movement for you and see if you can see it. And you see how the movement of creation, as it is recorded in Genesis 1 and the first part of Genesis 2, you see how it goes all the way from nothing, you know, all the way uh, to the garden and to the tree of learning good and evil. And can you see that it goes there by way 
of the Sabbath rest of God. Genesis 2, verses 1 through 4. There's the movement, and it stops at the tree of learning good and evil. Why does it stop? What's going on at that tree of learning good and evil? You understand that the tree of learning good and evil is not evil. It's part of the creation. It's good. God made it. Um, it's, it's, uh, it stops there because in order for the creation to be completed, for it to be finished, man has to be tested in his heart. He has to decide whether or not he's going to give his love to God or to some other God, like an idol, like himself. And until he gives himself to God, the creation remains unfinished. Um, I guess I say that here in lines 90 to 93. Going in here to line 94, I'm on the handout, the, the uh, additional comments. I present this as the fundamental movement of creation, which, as St. Maximus says, is eternal. This is the stone, let's say, this movement of creation, this erotic movement of creation, is, let's say, it's the stone. So we're now going back to a couple of the images that we touched on last week. It's the stone, let's say, on which the law was inscribed, as we read in Exodus 24, 12. And then somebody asked on the Zoom, does the smashing of the stone have any kind of theological meaning? Uh, I'm sure that it does, and I'm offering this now, after having been able to think about it for a week, I'm offering this as a possibility. Perhaps the smashing of that first tablet, of the first stone tablets of the law, is a prophetic allusion to the death of God. When the cornerstone, the rock, of Christ, is destroyed on the cross. Now on Sinai, God writes that law again. How can he do that? Because the law is spiritual. It cannot be destroyed. And Christ is the Son of God. He cannot be destroyed. The law, in fact, is the only begotten God himself. That is to say, it's Christ. Christ is the only begotten God. And Christ is the only begotten God, he who is, reveals not the shadow of God, as did Moses, but he reveals the Father, whom no one has ever seen. John chapter 1, verse 18, that's what it says. Um, the, great, um, the law came through Moses, John 1, 18. The law came through Moses. Grace, uh, let's see. Okay. But grace came through... Um, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Yeah. There's, there's a... I'm not, on, I'm not working on all cylinders tonight, guys, sorry. Yes, because the law came through Moses, the grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Um, God, no one has ever seen. That is, you could say, you could take that to mean the divine essence. No one has ever seen the divine essence. But then goes on to say, the only begotten God. And then there's this Greek construction. Are you, you don't have your Greeks with you? It's haon. Okay. Ha -on. The only begotten God, He who is in the bosom of the Father, He has made it known. That phrase, Ha'on, He who is, takes you back to Exodus 3.14. Remember, the Lord appears to Moses in the burning bush, which we take as an, as a, as an image of the Virgin Mary. And, the, and Moses asks him, well, what's your name? You know, the Israelites are going to ask me. Well, who is this God that's telling, saying he's going to deliver them from Pharaoh? You're kidding me. What's his name that he thinks he can do that? All right, you tell him. In the Greek, and, and, and in Exodus 3.14, it's the same, same phrase. Ha'on, he who is. And in fact, you know, it's, it's what you see on the icons of Christ. Um, that's what those letters mean. It's the Greek for Ha'on, he who is. He who is. So when St. John says, uh, no one has ever seen God, but the only begotten God, he who is in the bosom of the Father, what he's saying is that this Jesus Christ, born of the Virgin Mary, this is the same Lord who appeared to Moses on Mount, on Mount Horeb in the burning bush. This is the one who's in our midst. 
So on sign, let's say where are we? So uh, yeah, so this this um, this law of God that has now become flesh, which is God Himself, is not revealing, you know, the, the shadow of the law, but because this Jesus Christ is Himself the law. And so the stone that was smashed on Mount Sinai, we might take that as an image of the earthen body of Christ that was destroyed on the cross. But the stone himself was not destroyed. Because the stone himself is the is he who is. You know? The eternal one who is in the bosom of the Father. He is the stone. He's the law. The earthen body is smashed because the Lord who was clothed in that body, nailed to it, why was it smashed? It was smashed because the Lord, the law incarnate, was obedient even to the point of death on the cross. So what does that mean? It means he denied himself. He lost his life for the sake of man in obedience to the Father. Here is erotic love expressed perfectly to the nth degree, losing itself into the beloved, into the beloved, even into the corpse of the beloved, where the corpse is dead. And so he completed the creation that Adam failed to do back there at the garden in front of the tree of learning good and evil. You understand that the tree, that the cross is the tree of learning good and evil. So, as I said last week, that if you go to Jerusalem, they'll tell you that uh, the Lord was crucified in the very spot that Adam fell. And that's absolutely true. Because he fell, because Adam fell here in the heart. The new Adam was obedient here in the heart, in the Garden of Eden. That has now become Golgotha. Obedience is what Adam was called to. The deification of his body is what Adam was called to. This deification or glorification was not complete until man, in the sanctuary of his heart, on the altar of his will, chose to be obedient to God, to deny himself and lose himself for the sake of God. Had Adam been obedient, what Christ accomplished in his death on the cross would have been accomplished in Adam. Because, moving on, Christ was obedient, but obedience is righteousness. It is the expression of love. Its consequence is life, not death, and that's all over the place in the Old Testament. Righteousness is immortal. What does it say? Um, the righteous will be an everlasting remembrance. He will not fear evil tidings. Death is the consequence of disobedience, of hatred. So when God, as Adam, was crucified because of his obedience. Do you get it? It doesn't fit. Obedience doesn't die. It doesn't. So the only way that God could die in perfect obedience was because he willed it to. No one forced him to die. He died voluntarily out of his love for man. And as a result, what's going to happen to disobedience? You know? This is why we say, this is what we mean. That death was destroyed by the death of God. Disobedience was destroyed by the obedience of the God-man. That's what that means. Death was shattered. Disobedience was shattered. And what did it reveal inside the tomb? What was revealed inside the tomb? It was the righteousness of God. The uncreated light of God. And there's all kinds of theology here. But by his death, then, the only begotten God divested himself of the earth and body subject to corruption because it was riddled with the disease of sin. And he clothed himself with the new body of his resurrection. This body of uncreated light was already revealed as being contained in the earth and body on Mount Tabor. That's where he was transfigured, right? That is, the stone body on which the law was inscribed, the Incarnation, is transfigured, deified, glorified, written, rewritten on the stone of the Lord's resurrected body, which is now the cornerstone of the church. Because in his death, the new Adam fulfills the law completely.
completely. And so the creation is completed in Christ, and it is established immutable, immutable, immovable. We say that in that first verse. He has established the earth so that it shall never be moved. How? On the cross. When he destroyed death by his death. So this leads to the insight that perhaps the completion of the creation is revealed to be the purpose of the law in the first place. There was, you know, at the heart of the law is the heart. At the heart of the law is the heart. That is the will of man. Choosing whom he will serve. Choosing to serve the Lord God, man goes far beyond the written ordinances of the law. When man chooses to serve the Lord God, he goes into his heart. And he becomes one with God, where the law originates. And so he comes to that place where there is no law. Because the law has become his very life. It is God has become his very life. And guess what, guys? The Old Testament saints experienced this all over the place. You read the Psalms. It's all over the place in the Psalms. This is not a New Testament phenomenon. What happened in the New Testament is that, 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 that the hope that was given to the righteous in the Old Testament from, you know, from the experience they had in their heart of righteousness, of, 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 the, of tasting the immortality of God, that hope was accomplished. It was fulfilled. And now the hope that they could live in God forever was realized. Because death has been destroyed in Christ's death. To speak in the, uh, in the imagery of the Garden of Eden, you could say that Christ, the tree of life, comes down from the summit of the mountain of Eden, and he is affixed, he is nailed to the tree of learning good and evil, and so he shatters by his obedience the tree's evil, and he transforms its death into the death of death. Okay, well, there's all, you know, I kind of get overwhelmed all of a sudden because there's so much theology that I want to get in front of you all at once. And again, all I have here is just cryptic notes, so where do I go from here? Um, yes, Garrett? So it's kind of what you're talking about, but I think it's a verse in the Old Testament about that God would write his law on your heart. Yes. I'm, yes, of course, yes. That's in several places, right? And so that's what you just, what you just described. Yeah, yeah. And so he does that through Jesus? Yes. Like, and that's the whole point of trying to get yes. to the team. Yes, yes. Okay, well, let, let's depart from the text. And let's just kind of, what do you call it? Uh, uh, free flow? I don't know what, whatever the word is. Because I, I want to speak directly to that point. There, there, there's, a, there's a point here that, that kind of is my burden, especially as I get older, closer to retirement. My time is not long anymore. There's a point that I want to get out. And I feel like I have not succeeded in getting it out. Or maybe it's just because people don't receive it. I don't know. When you're baptized, what does it say in Romans chapter 6? Those who have been in the, see, help me out, guys. Again, I'm not functioning at all. Romans chapter six. Um, if you were baptized with Christ, you were baptized with Him in the likeness. You died with Christ in the likeness of His death, right? Well, what does that mean? The likeness of His death. In biblical language, likeness means to participate in. If Adam was made in the likeness of God, that means that he was created with the, past, with the capacity to participate in God, to be intimate with God. So if we are baptized into the likeness of Christ's death, that means that through the visible form of that sacrament, that mystery, something happens to us. Death has been destroyed in us. We're no longer dead. We're alive. But we must, you know, in order to finish, if you will, that, that death that we have now died in, in Christ, we have to participate in Christ's death, in the likeness of his death. We have to participate in it. What does that mean? <laughs> it means that we ourselves now have to go, I mean, it means that we have to stand before the tree of learning good and evil, and we have to be tested, as was Adam. Now, if we're going to let ourselves be tested, 
as ourselves, as Adam was, will fall because we're corrupted, we're perverted. But if we have clothed ourselves with Christ, if we've clothed ourselves with his death, then I can stand in front of that tree of learning good and evil and I can let myself be tested by clinging to Christ, clinging to his death. That's when you discover the suffering that we've talked about before in the Christian faith. That's when we discover how much we love death. You know, we love, that's when we discover that acting as though I'm God, being as though I'm God has become like the very fiber of my being now. And to cling, my, and to, cling to Christ, which is the only way that I'm going to conquer myself, is perhaps the most difficult thing for anyone ever to do. That's when you go through hell. That's when you go through hell. Um, that's why we have the church. To help us in that battle. Listen, if Christ's death was real, and his resurrection was real, and if baptism is real, it's not just a rite. You know, it's not just a ritual. But if it's an actual, concrete, physical, real participation in the death of Christ, then why should we expect that our life should be anything less than the real deal? I mean, why should we expect that our life would become a ritual? Nothing more than a ritual. Now we can go through our life, you know, confessing Christ, being nice and goody two-shoes, um, but never, never dealing with my love for death. You know, my, my love to hate people. My love for anger. Um, my love for myself. And it's when we turn in that direction, you know, begin to engage ourselves, that's when, we, that's when we come upon that wall of enmity, you know, that, that we have built. And so the only way that I can be raised in the likeness of Christ, that the only way I can participate in his resurrection, is by participating in his death, you know, by taking up my cross, denying myself, um, like we read in, uh, in the St. Macarius on the back of the bulletin last Sunday, um, when I uh, compel my heart to love God and to follow His commandments, when my heart doesn't want to. That's when you discover hell. That's when you discover that you're in hell now. You understand what I'm trying to say? I don't know. If, I don't know. It's like one has to go through it. Otherwise, it's just a story, it's just a ritual something you believe. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. So anyway, you know that's I know that's that that's what uh, that's what we're trying to do here is we're trying to uh, present the vision, the map um, of this journey into the tomb of my heart, as into the Lord's tomb, so that we know we know where we're supposed to be going. We know how we're supposed to be doing it. We're supposed to be know, we know what we're supposed to be doing. Um, the church will teach us. The church does teach us through her fathers, through her scriptures. When we read those scriptures in the church and not in our own mind, but in the church. And we let the church interpret the scriptures for us. We do not interpret the scriptures because we'll mess it up. And we'll never make our way to the tomb. We'll always somehow be finding our going, we'll come to the tomb where the serpent's head is crushed, we'll come there and hope, oh, oh, nope, right back. <laughs> so yeah, maybe as you get older, maybe the journey gets harder, I don't know, maybe, because I don't remember being this hard before. <laughs> Barb, you have a question? If we die with Christ in our baptism, and then infer that we no longer need to fear him. We don't, but do we? We shouldn't, but do we? 
And that's a rhetorical question, Mark. Each person has to ask, answer that for himself. But you're right, and to the degree that I fear death, I might be in, that might be an indication of the degree to which I have not yet died to Christ, or in Christ. It may be an indication to what, what extent idolatry is still holding on to me. Katie. So I think, like, just um, a sense of God, maybe partially why you feel like your point hasn't taken so far, is our culture is very much kind of swamped with an image of Christians as being happy. <laughs> Where, at least from my own experience, I would say that success, if such a word is even valid, at this testing, feels like death itself. And it's a, not, it doesn't pass, is the thing. It doesn't what? It doesn't pass. It's not this moment and oh. we pass immediately to the resurrection. Like, uh -huh. we have to wait until we actually biologically die to experience the resurrection. Okay, you're right, although I would qualify it with this. We do have tastes of the resurrection. For example, in the Divine Liturgy. Right. right. And even in our daily life, God visits us, and he, he, he overshadows us with His grace. Why? To assure us that it's real, but also to remind us what we're fighting for. I think you're exactly right, because our culture is so... But I'm so happy that we're miserable. Have you, have you observed how broken people are underneath the surface? I mean, this world is just... Just about everybody has issues. This world is incredibly broken. You wonder how we even survive. Um, you look at the icons. How many of them are happy? They're all very sober. How many laughing icons of the Thyatokos do we know? How many weeping icons of the Theotokos do we know? Can we even plumb the grief of the Theotokos? Not just for her son, but for her world. We are her children. And she's weeping for us in depths that we can't even imagine. Um, I read in, in St. Siloam, we need to draw this to a close, but uh, something that really struck me, uh, Archimedes Drisophoni was just describing the daily life of, of Siloam, not necessarily to make a point, but just to describe his life. And, but it was very profound what he said, that uh, Siloam really, he did not make any, how would you say, uh, um, intense effort to strain to be holy. You know what I'm trying to say? He simply went through the, he just simply did the, did the, went through the forms. In the monastic life, well, you have services, you have all the services every day, you have this monastic rhythm, and you just get into the monastic rhythm, you just do it. And it's that rhythm, it's the services, it's the prayers of the church that made him into a saint. I mean, he did his part, obviously, he prayed, and he did work to, 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 to destroy the, you know, to defeat the passions within himself, but he didn't do it by himself. He did it in the community of the monastic community. And it was the services of the church, the prayers of the church, the rhythm of the church's life that, that shaped him and turned him into a saint. We don't have that here, do we? And it's like we're all, we're all on our own. You come to church maybe once a week, here at St. Hermes, and at other parishes, we try to have services more often. But even so, you know, you come here and you go back into the world and what is it that's shaping you? You go back home, you turn on the TV. You look at your screen. Wait, what's shaping you? What's filling your mind? You know? And then we wonder why, why um, we have so many issues. <laughs> what are we feeding ourselves with? You know? So this is, a real, this, is a, this is a real challenge for us, is it not, here in America? And we have to be careful because then if you try to fix the challenge in your own way, well, you can become a nut now. <laughs> because you go overboard. Um, it's a real challenge. It's a real challenge. But that's also the, the point. Of, to, there, there also is simply the fact that you uh, you don't have to tr you don't have to try to become a saint. You just do what the church tells you to do in your own circumstances. You know, according to your own strength, the best you can, 
And God, by His mercy and grace, will make you what He wants you to be. He will make it. He will make you. You just do the best you can under your circumstances and with your strength. All right. All right. <laughs> we need to close this. So let's stand and we'll say closing prayer. Truly, it is me to bless you, Thea Pope, most ever blessed and most pure in the mother of our God, more honorable than the cherubim, whom our glory is beyond compared to the seraphim, without corruption, let us give birth to God over to the Pope, who magnify you. Christ is in our midst. He is in our midst.